What is up people? Welcome to another episode of Iconic Engines. Today we are doing our first ever non-Japanese engine and we are starting with something pretty special. We are starting with one of the greatest four cylinders, no maybe the greatest four cylinder BMW has ever made. The legendary S14 engine that powered the E30 M3. Also, the geniuses behind some of the greatest performance electronics products out there, AEM, are still on board and are still supporting the iconic engine series. That's of course really good news because it enables me to make more of these videos and to keep improving them. So everybody, a big thank you to AEM. So whatever it is that you're building with your car and engine, whether it is something you want to drag race in or road race or maybe you want to do some time attack or some rally cross or you want to drift, whatever it is that you want to do, AEM's got you covered. They have some really amazing products from engine management systems to digital display dashes to all sorts of gauges imaginable. AEM's got it all and their products have proven themselves in some of the greatest builds out there. AEM delivers on every level from amateur racing to top tier professional motorsports. So if you need some serious performance electronics for your build, definitely check out AEM. There's links to many of their cool products in the description. So in this week's poll, I asked you guys to tell me what you think is the sexiest word ever. And we got a lot of cool and funny answers. But sadly, none of these are correct. Because none of these are the sexiest word ever. The sexiest word ever is homologation. Huh? Homo what? What about heterologation? Wait. Wait, allow me to explain. Homologation is the sexiest word ever. Because thanks to homologation, some of the sexiest cars of all time were made available to the public. Without homologation, we wouldn't have this, or this, or this, or this, and so much more. The same goes for the BMW E30 M3 seen by many as the purest, as the greatest, as the essential form of the M3. Without homologation, it would have never happened. So homologation may be all about administrative procedures and rules and regulations and requirements and whatnot, and it may not sound sexy, but when you think about it, it is sexy, because it makes very, very sexy things happen. How do you become a cool car manufacturer in Germany and in Europe? By winning the DTM, of course. What's DTM, you ask? DTM is Germany's Touring Car Championship. DTM stands for, well, at least it used to stand for Deutsche Turnwagen Meisterschaft. And you win it by taking one of your sporty coupes or sedans, putting it on a weight loss and steroid treatment, turning it into a monster, race it on the Hockenheim, win the DTM and get an instant boost to reputation, image and sales. Of course, all the major brands want to win it. And of course, BMW wants to win it too. But there's a catch. You can't just take any car and turn it into a monster and then race it in the DTM. Whatever you race with in the DTM has to have a mass production equivalent. Basically, you have to do your homologation. If you don't do it, no DTM for you. I told you, homologation, it's sexy. So BMW started to prep its 3 Series and turn it into a future DTM champion. Now, originally BMW did think about shoving a straight 6 engine into the new E30 M3 because BMW is really good at making straight six engines, but they gave up on the idea because in motorsport and in racing, sometimes weight and weight balance is more important than power. If you remember the Tom's Castro Supra from our last Iconic Engines video, you will see that it too dropped its straight six engine in favor of an inline four engine. The BMW E30 M3 did the same thing. An inline four weighs less. That makes the car weigh less and gives it better balance. 
and sometimes these things are more important ingredients in the winning recipe than power output alone. So the E30 M3 was to get an inline four-cylinder engine and the S14 it eventually received was designed by a man called Paul Roche. Now that's the American pronunciation of his name but because he was German we're gonna say it right it's Paul Roche. Now Mr. Roche is one of the greatest engine designers of all time. I think he deserves an entire video for himself and I might just do that in the near future. During his time in BMW Every successful engine BMW had in motorsports had Mr. Roche behind it. He designed all of them. In fact, when it was time for Mr. Roche to design the S14 engine, he had already designed so many good engines for BMW before that that he didn't have to work from scratch at all. He could use elements from his previous designs to create a really great engine. For the engine block, he used the M10 engine block, which he also designed. It's one of the most sturdy and resilient engine block designs ever. It's one of BMW's greatest engine blocks and to show you how good it is I'll just tell you that the M12 Formula 1 engine which is based on the M10 engine is still today the most powerful Formula 1 engine that ever existed. I think that's enough of an argument in favor of the M10 engine block. <laughs> The cylinder head was taken from another one of Mr. Roche's designs, namely the M88 engine. This engine had already proven itself in the BMW M1 and the 635 CSI. But because the M88 is a straight 6 engine, a combustion chamber amputation operation had to be carried out. Two combustion chambers were removed and a new 4 combustion chamber cylinder head was created. This new cylinder head was then installed on the M10 engine block. BMW added some individual throttle bodies and the legendary S14 engine was born. The newly developed E30 M3 with the S14 engine was so good that it became the most successful touring car of all time. It's a record that it still holds today and will likely hold for a pretty long time into the future. When it comes to touring car championships, during its years in the motorsport, the E30 M3 won everything. But the E30 M3 and S14 combo, they did more than that. They proved that people wanted to own cars that were basically an offspring of a race car and passenger car marriage. People wanted to own road legal race cars and were ready to pay good money for it. The BMW E30 M3 crushed all sales estimates made by BMW and started one of the most important sports car lineages in history. So let's talk about the specs and see what makes the S14 such a great engine. Let's start with the basics. Bore and stroke. The S14 has 93.4 millimeters of bore and 84 millimeters of stroke. This gives us a total displacement of 2.3 liters and a very over square engine design. This of course makes sense because the S14 was built to spend a lot of its time in the high rev range. However, a 2.3 liter version wasn't the only displacement available for the S14. Italian and Portuguese markets got a 2 liter version which was created by reducing the stroke of the S14. This was made to accommodate the taxation issues of these markets. There was also a 2.5 liter version in the European market and this had both a larger bore 
and stroke than the standard most common 2.3 liter version of the S14. As we already know, the engine block of the S14 is the M10 cast iron engine block. This is a really good proven engine block design. It's very sturdy and very resilient. It's a five main bearing design and inside it you can find a forged steel crankshaft which is fully counterweight and as you can see very very beefy. The pistons are cast and both the pistons and the rods are really well designed and well made and they pretty much never cause any sort of issues on these engines. The compression ratio is also very high and performance oriented when you take into account the age when the S14 was made. It ranged from a 10.2 to a very high 11 to 1. The cylinder head uses an aluminum alloy as its material and a dual overhead camshaft design. We also have some buckets and some shims over the buckets used to push onto the valves. The combustion chambers are a pent-roof design with good squish areas and a spark plug in the middle. On the basic 2.3 liter version of the S14 engine we have 240 degrees of camshaft duration on both the intake and the exhaust and a very high 10 millimeters of camshaft lift on both the intake and exhaust. However, these camshaft profiles were changed in favor of even more aggressive ones on the EVO 2 and EVO 3 versions of the S14. The valve sizes are of course also performance oriented and we have 37 millimeters on the intake valves and 33 millimeters on the exhaust valves. Both of the cam gears are driven by a timing chain. Now the timing chain itself is a really good dual roll design and it will almost never cause any sort of issues throughout the entire life of the engine. However, during the entire production run of the S14, BMW used a bunch of different timing chain tensioners. Now some of these did not really work as intended and they did cause some you know, tensioning issues as well as increased wear. So many owners of the S14 choose to upgrade to the S52 timing chain tensioner. Something really cool on the S14 engine is that it comes with individual throttle bodies from the factory. This means that every cylinder has its own throttle body and throttle plate as opposed to four cylinders having just one big intake plenum and a single throttle body and throttle plate. Now individual throttle bodies ensure an amazing throttle response and a really really cool soundtrack. <laughs> The internal diameter of these throttle bodies on the S14 engine was 46 mm in the first version of the S14 and was enlarged to 48 mm on later versions of the S14. The power output of the S14 is pretty impressive when you consider that it's a 30 plus year old engine now and the power output ranged from 189 horsepower to a really impressive 235 horsepower. The power output really depended on whether there was a catalytic converter or not, uh, in which market the engine was sold and what was the engine version. Now before we start talking about tuning, there's something that has to be said and it's probably something you're aware of when it comes to the E30 M3. Values and prices of this car have skyrocketed. The E30 M3 is a very sought after classic car now and its prices are very high. So, that being said, tuning and messing about with a clean example of this car and its S14 engine isn't going to be a cost only in terms of the parts and labor to tune the car. It's going to be a cost in the sense that you are going to reduce the value of this car. So extensive modifying of the E30 M3 nowadays usually happens in the form of modifying a car that's in bad condition, damaged, has a million coats of paint and has an engine that is you know, a very high mileage engine that either has some problems or some damage itself as well. By doing that to a car like this, you are increasing the cost of the labor. But that increase isn't even comparable to the loss in value that would occur if you were to extensively modify a very clean example of an E30 M3 that could otherwise fetch a very high price, let's say at an auction or a you know simple sales ad. So with that being said, if you have a clean example, if you're lucky enough to have one, 
it's your car, it's your money. You can do whatever you want and you should do whatever you want, but it's something to be aware of in a financial sense. So now that we have addressed our financial concerns, so let's talk about the actual tuning. So tuning, what's basically a racing engine. Even if you don't do anything to an S14 engine, it's really gonna be a fun engine to drive. It's a real joy to drive these engines hard. They've been designed to, to be revved high and to be pushed hard. And these engines love it and they respond really well to that. Because they're basically racing engines adapted to normal driving conditions. They're very, very high strung right from the factory. And that being said, because they're very high strung, uh, they are designed to take abuse really well, but they aren't really engines designed to cover continents and be dri daily driven and, you know, so they don't, so they aren't really able of doing giant, you know, mileages. Now, usually, uh, S14 engines start to lose performance and compression and they start to burn oil around 150k to 170k miles. Now I'm not telling you that they're gonna blow up at these miles, they're just gonna slowly start to deteriorate. There are S14s out there that did 250k miles and even more because they are really reliable engines, but they won't perform at these mileages as they did on day one. I mean, no engine really will, but they do have a bit of a shorter lifespan because they're high strung compared to your average, I don't know, Camry motor or even a BMW engine that's designed for regular passenger cars. So this is something to be aware of if you're chasing one of these engines. If it has a bunch of miles, it's probably gonna need a rebuild uh, in order to be enjoyed fully. Now, uh, stage zero. As I said, these engines have a great stage zero. They're really fun from the factory. But there's something that you have to understand when it comes to these engines. Many people love the E30 M3 and it's it was their dream car growing up. They saw this car win touring car championships. They dream about it and then these people grow up and they have enough money to buy one and then they go buy one or get a test drive and many of these people end up being disappointed. And they say, you know, the car doesn't perform, it's slow, it, it isn't what I expected. And I, and I read a bunch of these articles and forum posts that can basically sum, be summed up into uh, you shouldn't meet your heroes. And what I want to say to that is that most of these people are missing the point. Many of us grow up driving regular, I don't know, cars like a Corolla, a Camry, a Volkswagen Golf. We drive this our entire life and these cars have been developed to appeal to the basic average driver. Everybody can drive these cars and enjoy them and they're great at, you know, throughout the entire rev range, they're easy to drive. And then, having driven these cars all your life, you sit in an E30 M3 and you don't get it. You don't get it because the car was designed it makes all of its performance at power at the last 1000 to 2000 RPMs. That's it. That's where all the fun is. Below that, this car looks and feels sort of torqueless and powerless. And as I said, that's, that's the case because it was designed to be driven really hard. When it's driven and pushed hard, it's one of the most enjoyable cars and engines out there, but you have to have the skill to make the most out of this engine. If you don't drive it hard, it's gonna feel weird and slow because you've been driven driving a Golf your entire life. You have to love and understand old school naturally aspirated performance to love and understand this engine. I mean, it's from the 80s. It doesn't have any sort of variable valve timing at all. So you can imagine where the torque was uh, you know, thing comes from. Below five, below, I don't know, even 6,000 RPMs, it sometimes feels kind of torqueless. But in the high rev range, it's massive, massive fun. But let's say 
that you want more power, you're power hungry. Well, this is an old school engine, it actually responds pretty well to tuning. The basic stuff you can do with this engine can actually get you some pretty fun power gains. So what can you do? Well, when it comes to the intake, you can really do nothing. The factory, you know, stock, ITBs are really good for a lot of power ranges, so honestly, don't touch them. They sound well, they work well, leave them. When it comes to the exhaust, the headers are also pretty well made and performance oriented and to get any gains in there, you are going to need some very serious, very well fabricated headers in order to get any sort of noticeable gains. Uh, when it comes to the camshafts, you can get some gains with some higher duration, more aggressive camshafts. Uh, they will often come at the expense of low end performance, although there are some um, mild cams that can get you a bit more torque and a bit more middle end power uh, as well. Middle end, uh, middle range uh, power as well. So you can you can do some stuff, but the biggest gain you can expect expect is by attacking the stock ECU. The stock S14 uses a Bosch Motronic fuel injection ECU. While it is good and it's reliable and usually doesn't cause any sort of uh, you know significant problems uh, compared to what modern standalone e standalone ECUs can do, uh, it's it's a joke. By replacing this thing with a more modern standalone ECU and by messing with the fuel maps and ignition, and if you're good at it, you can expect some pretty noise noticeable power gains from doing that. So that's something you can do as well. But let's say that all of this isn't enough. Let's say that you want big, extreme, naturally aspirated power. How do you get that? Well, of course, we fall in the footsteps of what BMW did to race this engine in the DTM. And in the DTM, depending on the displacement, uh, the 2.5 liter engine made around 350 to 370 horsepower, naturally aspirated. But you have to understand that to get this sort of power out of a uh, four-cylinder engine is almost always going to come at the expense of drivability. The more power you make in the top end, and all of it is going to be in the top end, the more drivability you're going to lose in the bottom end and in the middle RPM range. <laughs> let's say you want it. How do you do that? Well, you can start by increasing the displacement on the standard 2.3 liter S14 engine. How do you do that? You overboard the block and you get yourself a crankshaft, a crankshaft with a longer stroke. You can get a EVO 3 crankshaft or a custom billet crankshaft. Both of these are going to be pretty expensive and almost always equally expensive because the EVO 3 cranks are expensive and rare and custom billet stuff is also expensive and rare, so it's pretty much your choice. Once you increase the displacement, you're going to be increasing the compression and then you're going to be increasing the uh, sizes of the intake ports. This engine actually has amazing exhaust ports and they're really well designed and you likely won't need to touch them at all. Uh, what you can do uh, on the intake side, well, you can replace, you can go crazy and replace the stock intakes with throttle plate intakes just like they were used in the DTM. Uh, these are of course expensive and your idle is going to be horrible but they are extremely responsive and they're good for top end performance. If you don't want to be crazy you can simply increase the sizes of the throttle bodies by finding some later EVO 3 uh, intakes. I think some EVO 2s as well uh, had some larger uh, throttle bodies, but correct me on that if I'm wrong. So once you do all of this and then you add to this some really wild camshafts, you, you're gonna have, I don't know, you can expect around 350 horsepower if you do things right and by the time you're done with it, you're gonna be totally broke and you're likely going to have a car that's illegal to drive on the road because you, you probably had to make the exhaust extremely free-flowing and extremely loud. So you're gonna have a really expensive car that you can only drive on the track, but once you do that, you're gonna be amazed on the track. An engine like this, a really high-strung, naturally aspirated racing engine is, is really, really, really fun, and it's a really special experience to drive something like that.
So that was the naturally aspirated career path. What else can we do? Well, of course, we live in a day and age where we put turbos on toasters. So you can also put a turbo on basically any engine and that, of course, encodes the S14. However, it does, in a way, sort of defeat the purpose of an S14. This is just my opinion and you can argue with that. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. It's gonna make the engine more powerful. It's gonna give it a lot more torque. It's gonna be amazing fun. And there are some really good turbo builds out there that I would love to take out for a spin. But as I said, it does a bit defeat the purpose of an S14. It's a naturally aspirated engine designed to rev high and to be driven hard and pushed hard. It's a typical racy, rev happy naturally aspirated engine and that's beautiful in itself and if you turbo this thing it will lose massive value it's just it, it is what it is you have to consider the financial uh you know aspect if you're not terribly rich or slash crazy or whatever so once you do that uh it will lose value but here's something you could do an idea if you want big turbo power if you want any sort of big power from from the e30 m3 chassis you can get the S14 out of the car, conserve it, you know, fill it up with oil to the brim, make sure it doesn't rust, and leave it aside. And then swap in there whatever you want. You can swap a bunch of different engines. There's a million ideas. People swapped pretty much everything into the E30 M3. And you can, you know, get it out of your system. Oh, come on. Come on. There we go. And make a big, huge power. Uh, E30 M3, have fun with that, the chassis is amazing to drive. And then once you're bored, if you're bored, you can restore the value of the car by putting the, you know, S14 back in that you have previously conserved. And that's a lot easier than trying to unturbo an engine because to get turbo power from an S14, you will need to replace the pistons. Definitely they're cast and they're not really happy with a turbo in them you will have to replace them, the rods can stay, or if you're aiming for big power, let's say around 450 horsepower, the rods should go too. The crankshaft can stay forever, the, that thing can take whatever you want. The M10 block is an amazing cast iron block, it can take heaps of boost, you don't have to worry about that at all. When it comes to turbos and manifolds, you have a lot of choices, and there are some sort of turbo kits out there, although not that many when compared to some other you know, engines, the turbo aftermarket aspect for the S14 isn't that strong because people don't do that as often as compared to some other much more plentiful engines. So with a good turbo build, you can expect around 400, 450 or so horsepower. What about supercharging? Well, supercharging kits for this engine are stupidly rare. Uh, there was an ETR kit and there was, I think, an RMS kit. Uh, even finding pictures for these ones was hard, so they're very, very rare and really hard to find. And whether they are bolt on or not depends on who you ask. So the rarity issue here is a problem. You will likely need to fabricate something. You can try to adapt and a supercharger kit for a different car if you have extensive fabrication skills. So you can supercharge this engine, you can make 250, 260. A horsepower with a bolt-on supercharger apparently but this really isn't done that often so you will likely need to do a lot of research and part hunting and fabrication it is what it is so that's it when it comes to the tuning of the s14 it really is a tuned engine already it's high strung from the factory and as i said in the beginning of the tuning section even if you don't do anything to it it's going to be massive fun so it really depends on you your goals budgets and you know as usual as it is with any engine it depends on a million factors but this thing it's fun the way it is and it's even more fun of course if you make it a crazy screamer and yeah that's that's it i'm gonna shut up i do like this engine it's a really cool thing it's a proper old school performance racing engine that loves to be driven hard so yeah by the way you probably haven't seen the rest of my shirt look at this Really cool shirt, right? Yeah. Hey, you gave me a shirt. Woo! So, um, what else? What do you think about the S14? Do you like it? Are you lucky enough to have owned one or still own one? Have you been? Have you driven one? Comment section. I would love to hear your opinion. As always, I'm open to suggestions on 
what engines should we be doing next. I'm going through my list. I'm updating it always based on your feedback and suggestions. So I'm going to end it here. I haven't forgotten the wrap. And because this is our first German engine, the wrap is also going to be in German. Ich habe ein super tolles Zylinderkopf. Was wartest du noch? Drück den Starrknopf. Ich bin das beste Motor auf dem Hockenheim. Dort bin ich so schnell, da überholt mich kein. Mein Name ist der BMW S410 und ein besseres Motor wirst du niemals sehen. I can't believe I did that. First try. See? This is how it works. Wrote them down. That's it. Amazing. The, I used to, sometimes I really fail at the English wrapping, like it takes like seven, eight tries. First try for German. Wow.